thankful for the presence of everyone this evening and trust that we will keep the gospel meeting in mind, having done our part to make sure that we've arranged our schedules to be here each and every time that the meeting is being conducted, three times during the Bible study and the worship service on Lord's Day morning and evening, and then, of course, Monday through Friday. And, of course, do all that we can to tell others about the meeting as well. In our study this evening, I'd like for us to see, as I'm sure that we do, the home is in deep trouble. And it's obvious to even the most casual observers that the home, the family, is in deep trouble. A great percentage of homes don't even resemble the family that we have described in the scriptures. And most of the problems of our society are often driven by these troubles that are in the home. Things like crime, drugs, mass shooting, violence, riots, looting, stealing. I mean, unless we've had our heads buried in the sand, we know what have been televised on the news media for the last two or three years, especially how did they truly fit every one of these categories that we have listed here? I want us to look at some of the challenges that they are to a godly family. The family is under attack in a very godless society. And to better define what I'm saying by godless society, Children are being born and raised without a godly family. And we see that when we see that there are just simply far too many who are born out of wedlock. In fact, the Center for Disease Control had this statement concerning the statistics that was back to 1921, 1921, <laughs> 2021, concerning unmarried childbearing. It said that the number of live births to unmarried women is nearly one and a half million. That the fertility rate for unmarried women is 38.6 births per 1,000 unmarried women from the ages of 14, uh, rather 15 to the age 44. And it reports that the percentage of all births to unmarried women is 40.5%. And far too many children are being raised without a father. There is a man by the name of Chuck Colson, who is a part of the prison fellowship ministry and this is their website. And here's what he says about children who grow up without a father in the home. Boys who grow up without a dad are at least twice as likely to end up in prison. 60% of adults and 72% of adolescent murderers never knew or lived with their father. And in the toughest inner cities, 10% of kids from two-parent families get in trouble, while 90% of, of broken homes get into trouble. And girls that are raised without a father in the home are five times as likely to become pregnant while they are adolescent. And children from broken homes are nearly twice as likely to drop out of high school. What I have here is a chart listing the number of families in the right-hand column. And the age, the date, not the age, but the date, um, starting back in 1950 and up to the present, or at least up to the last year, 2023. And really what this chart is saying is that almost a quarter, exactly 23%, 
of U.S. children under the age of 18 live with the one parent and no other adults. And that is more than three times the number of children around the world. For example, in comparison, 3% of children in China are raised in families of only one parent. 4% of children in Nigeria, 5% of children in India live in single parent families. But our neighbor in Canada, the number is a little more at 15%. But let's not forget the 23% that characterizes our country of having children that have but just one parent. And two, <clears throat> it's interesting, we know that it's this next little thing is increasing in number. I don't have any statistics on it, but we all know that the numbers are increasing in our day and time concerning children that are being raised in same-sex marriages. They are ever-increasing anti-marriage, anti-family <coughs> messages, propaganda, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to describe it to be, that is made. And all of that, it just simply seeks to destroy the family as we know it. From a website called National File, we see that truly the feminists want to destroy the family. This is highlighted in a book that was written in 2019 called Feminism Against the Family, written by a woman by the name of Sophia Lewis. And the writer of this article said, feminist writer wants to abolish the family for a feminist future. And so this new book outlines the threat being made to the nuclear family, how that it, it poses a threat to feminism. And here's what the article went ahead to say about the book. As certain political agendas become more out in the open, one particular agenda has been perfectly distilled in the headline published earlier today by Vice Magazine. The article titled, We Cannot Have a Feminist Future Without Abolishing the Family, brings to the fore what obstinately is at the crux of the female or the feminist ideology, the total dissolution of the nuclear family. Overall, the article brazenly admits, despite its utopian theme, what in practice is the logical conclusion of her brand of feminism, the dissolution of the nuclear family and the atomization of Western society. This next website is a website that's been dedicated to Phyllis, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, Schaeffler. She was an American lawyer. She was a activist being against feminism, against the homosexual agenda. She is not living anymore. She died, I think, in 2016. But this has been an organization and a website set up to carry on her uh, things, her agenda, her thinking toward feminism, or her being the anti-feminist and against the homosexual movement. This article talks about how the feminists have used COVID-19 to abolish the family. It says that the radical feminist Sophia Lewis used a Soros-funded digital media platform to suggest that we should use the coronavirus quarantine as a reason to abolish the traditional nuclear family. I'm not exaggerating what she said. I'm not taking anything out of context. She literally said this. We deserve better than the family, and the time of corona is an excellent time to practice abolishing it. She went on to justify her claim by linking the coronavirus quarantine to a spike in domestic violence. 
That's where this Sophia Lewis goes completely off the rails. From there, she makes the wild leap that the family is not a safe place for women and children because given enough time together, all men will eventually be violent. And this is another article from the front page magazine.com entitled Progressive Destruction, the pandemic is the perfect time to abolish the family. Goes on talking about this Sophia Lewis. It says, Lewis approvingly quotes feminist Madeline Lane McKinley, who had this to say in a tweet about the shelter in place operative, quote, households are capitalism's pressure cookers. This crisis will see a surge in homework, I'm sorry, housework, cleaning, cooking, caretaking, but also child abuse, molestation, intimate partner rape, psychological torture, and more. And it's not just the feminist movement that is such a cause for the family being into deep trouble. It's Marxism as well, and if you're not familiar with what a Marxist is, we're talking about communism. And I can't say enough about communism. I grew up during the Cold War. We were always constantly concerning ourselves with Russia and its government. And now we are, what, two generations away from that. And many of our young people have no concept of communism of what it involves, what it does to people. So anyway, Marxism is communism. So even Marxist wants to destroy the family. And this is from a website called The American Thinker, an article written by Larry Anderson entitled The Abolition of the Family. It says that America is headed down an extremely dangerous path to a potential catastrophe that is rarely discussed. It is the eradication of the family. And he says that the abolition of the family, this is a quote from the Communist Manifesto. The abolition of the family, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, but the Beresois family, and what that simply is, is the common class the middle class. Family will disappear in the course of history and its supplement, private property, disappears. And both will vanish with the destruction of capital. Of course, their buzzword is capitalism. The word that they hate the most is capitalism because they think all property ought to be owned by the government and they believe that everything that is done ought to be government controlled. That's communism. And that, of course, was the statement, as we said, it was from the Communist Manifesto in, that was written by Karl Marx and by Frederick Engels. Now, <clears throat> it says concerning this, the surest and quickest way to eliminate the family is to make certain that a young man who might wish to marry and start a family does not have access to a job. This ensures that the young man has no reason to remain with an impregnated female. And without a job, a man has no incentive to start or remain with this family. And really the point of that article is that the stimulus money, back when we had the crash in 2008, up from about 2008 to 2010 under the Bush and Obama administration, is ultimately destructive to the family. And we, of course, have seen the number of government handouts that have taken place not since 2008 and the crash of the economy, but we've seen it all during the COVID pandemic. People don't have to work anymore. The government's paying them to stay home. And all of this is playing 
to, well, it, it, let's just see here. In this book, it's called Take Down. Paul Kenzu makes this statement. Breakdown details the far left's quest to redefine and in some cases outright abolish the traditional family and marriage from the 1880s to today. It notes that gay marriage is serving as a Trojan horse for the far left to secure the takedown of marriage it has long wanted and countless everyday Americans are oblivious to this older, deeper, destructive forces long at work. The typical gay marriage advocate is not aware of this much older and more sinister ideological history. And again, this is all talking about how that even aside from feminism, we've got Marxism, communism. That's all concerning the destruction of the family, the destruction of marriage. So they seek to destroy the family as we know it. We know that there are increasingly states. I don't know, I don't know, maybe there's all 50 states now that have sanctioned same-sex marriages. If they haven't, there's a majority. The majority of the 50 have sanctioned. And living together, and raising children without being married. All of these things we see are the attack that is being made by this godless society that we live in. And then there is the LGBTQIA+. You know, it used to be back in the 1990s, when this thing first got started, it was LGBT. But they keep adding letters to the alphabet. I'm, I told Diane the other day, it won't be a surprise if they use all 26 letters of the alphabet before it's over with. But you see the increasing number of letters of the alphabet and the symbols, the plus sign that is now being associated with this movement. And just in case you're not familiar with this new, new way of designation, L is for lesbian, gay, G is for gay, B is for bisexual, T is for transgender, Q is for queer, or sometimes it can refer to questioning, I is for intersex, A is for asexual, and this thing is mushrooming so greatly that they just now have added the plus that hopefully will include every other type of who knows what. So that's what it all breaks down to. There were 89 House representatives that introduced the Transsexual Bill of Rights. This was an article that was posted by Zachary Mettler in July of 22. And it's listed in the website of the Daily Citizen. A group of Democrats in the House of Representatives has unveiled a new transgender bill of rights that poses a great threat to religious liberty, women's sports, and the integrity of the medical profession. The bill redefines the very exist essence of what a woman is by equating biological men who simply claim they are or want to be women with actual women. If enacted, any male who believes he is a female would be legally permitted to participate in and compete against women in female athletics. This is an effort this, in effect, would mean the end of women's sports as we know it nationwide. And you could say goodbye to any other sex-segregated facility, restroom, club, or team. 
It's my understanding that this same bill was introduced into the Senate. And that took place in May, no, March of last year, 2023. And I couldn't find any information that gave me a definite know-how as to whether this bill has been approved, that is made into law. But one thing we all know for sure is that it certainly has been implemented. Whether it's a law yet, it's implemented. And we're seeing it in sports and in all of the other areas of like what this article went ahead to say that this would truly have an impact in regards. And we do know that President Biden signed this LGBTQI plus Pride Month as an executive order. In fact, the White House hosted a Pride Month reception where President Biden signed an executive order, quote, a proclamation of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex Pride Month in 2022. And here's what the executive order says. An onslaught of dangerous anti, you, you can read it, legislation has been introduced and passed in states across the country, targeting transgender children and their parents and interfering with their access to health care. Today and every day, my administration stands with every LGBT American in the ongoing struggle against intolerance, discrimination, and injustice. We condemn the dangerous state laws and bills that target LGBT youth. And this is an accompanying fact sheet that went along with the executive order. Over 300 anti-LGBT laws have been introduced in state legislatures over the past year. And many of them specifically target transgender children and their parents by banning access to medical care and the support at school. So really what this, and I'm sorry I didn't put that one up. Really what this order does, it changes the department, it char charges the Department of Education and Health and Human Services with creating a sample policy for the states. In other words, those states that have already passed these laws against transgenders, now the government, the federal government is saying, look states, here's what you gotta do. Now here is a sample policy that you need to follow related to education and medical intervention that attempts to transition children into the opposite sex or some alternative gender. And the administration also targets so-called conversion therapy, which it calls a discredited and dangerous practice that seeks to suppress or change the sexual orientation or gender identity of LGBT people. One other thing, while I was on this website, and that is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It says no school lunch unless you embrace LGBT ideology. This was posted by Jeff Johnson in May of, of 22. The USDA and Food and Nutrition Service, FNS, announced that it was redefining sex-based discrimination in all of its federal programs to include these two broad, unscientific, ill-defined subjective terms. Where sex discrimination used to mean discrimination against someone because they were either male or female, the USDA now includes discrimination on the basis of changeable characteristics like sexual identity, thoughts, feelings, or actions. So as a result of this redefinition, the announcement said state and local agencies program operators and sponsors that receive funds from NSS 
must investigate allegations of discrimination based on gender identity or sexual orientation. So what that means is public, private, and religious schools across the country that take part in the national school lunch program and the school breakfast program, these schools must all develop policies that treat transgender identified students as the opposite sex or whatever gender they claim to be. And public and nonprofit, including religious, residential, childcare institutions, also participate in these programs. If they refuse to hire a homosexual or transgender identified staff member, they could lose funding, even if this hiring would violate their religious beliefs. And then the Department of Education. The DOE wants to redefine sex in Title IX, erasing women, threatening privacy and safety, and then endangering school children. This was written too by Jeff Johnson. The Department of Education recently announced that it was formulating new regulations for Title IX the landmark 1972 act that banned discrimination on the basis of sex in education. What Title IX was passed, or when Title IX was passed, of course, sex meant male and female. That's what it was in 1972. Discrimination on the basis of sex was discrimination on the basis of whether you were male or female. Now, the current administration wants to erase those very real categories. The DOE says sex must now include sex stereotypes, sex characteristics, pregnancy or related conditions, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And again, this is another article from the Daily Citizen concerning the Family Policy Alliance claims that the DOA will use its power to force girls to share private spaces like showers, locker rooms, and bathrooms with males. That it will force girls to lose sex-specific scholarships to males who want to identify as females. And potentially further the LGBT political agenda in public school curriculum and policies. It will silence girls who express concern about their privacy and safety shutting down any opposition to transgender ideology by labeling disagreement as discrimination. That's going to be the word, and that is the word that we hear more and more and more. It used to be discrimination was male, female. It used to be the discrimination was white and black. But now discrimination is our gender identity. All of this that has to do with the things that we're talking about in matters of the different definitions. That's why some of our people in high places can't define what a woman is because of this stuff. And it will allow students to file official harassment claims if they are not addressed by their preferred pronouns, even when those are not aligned with their biological sex. So, homes are coming apart. Somebody points to the fact that, well, divorce is down from what it was years ago. Well, any improvement, if you want to call it improvement in divorce, it's all misleading because what we have to take in consideration is that people are not getting married anymore. They're living together. So naturally the divorce rate 
is going to come down because people ain't getting married. They're still enjoying all of the benefits of marriage, but they're remaining unmarried. They're living together. And homes are falling apart because, as we know, for the last 50, 60, 75 years, divorce can be had for any cause. And you can be remarried as many times as you please. Families are torn apart by strife. And the dysfunctional families, these are the very ones that are being paraded as the norm to our children and to our grandchildren and to us as adults as well. So the family is under attack in a godless society, yes. But there are failings, too, among those that respect God's plan for the home. There are those that agree God's plan for the family is best, but they don't always follow the plan. And we're going to look at Abraham in just a minute. And even that is among the believers. Even among believers, you hear of premarital, extramarital sexual relationships taking place. Divorce, whether the divorces are scriptural or not. You hear it among those that, that are supposed to be Christians. And families are torn apart by anger, by friction, by strife. So yes, the home is in deep trouble. And we've seen, I hope, the challenges that a, a godly home has. Now I want us to look at the cause of these challenges. The cause is the rejection of God. That's the cause. The rejection of God and an absolute standard. Those two things go together. You can't separate them. God is rejected because we know that evolution is taught as if it were fact in schools, in news media, you name it. God has been pushed out of school, government, the workplace. He's been pushed out. You name it. And he's been pushed out. In fact, this Gallup poll said that belief in God in the United States dips to 81% which is a new low. Again, another chart that shows from back a little bit before, I would imagine this is probably about 1940, maybe before World War II, and comes up to 2020. And we see the trend of where belief in God was up into the 80s, or uh, 90s, all the way, almost close to 100. But now we see where it is as time brings us up to our day. And this little article that Gallup made mention of in their website said that the younger, the liberal Americans least are likely to believe in God. Belief in God has fallen the most in recent years among young adults and people on the left of the political spectrum, liberals and Democrats. These groups show drops of 10 or more percentage points compared to the 2022 figures to the average of the 2013 to 2017 polls. Most other key subgroups have experienced at least a modest decline, although conservatives and married adults have had essentially no change. The groups with the largest decline Although also the groups that are currently least likely to believe in God, including liberals, 62%, young adults, 68%, Democrats, 72%. Belief in God is highest among political conservatives, 94%, and Republicans, 92%, reflecting that religious and is a major determinant or detriment, I'll get it right in a minute, it's a major detriment of political division in the United States. 
So, when we reject God and we reject his word, anything goes. Without the fear of God, there is no more. The person that denies God has no restraints. Let's look at Psalms 14, verse 1. The first part of the verse says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Now, we know who we're referring to. We know what they say. The fool has said there is no God. Now, notice what else the verse says. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. I like what the pulpit, pulpit commentaries made on this statement. Their atheism is accompanied by deep moral corruption. We have no right to say that this is always so, but the tendency of atheism to relax moral restraints is indisputable. Not only is the rejection of God an, an absolute standard, a cause for the challenges that the home faces, but so is culture. Our culture has put pressure on families to violate God's word. It's kind of like fish that don't realize they're wet. We can become so immersed in culture, and what I mean by that is society, that we don't realize the impact that it's having on us. You know, Abraham and Sarah were influenced by culture. I'm sure most of us remember the story of how that God promised Abraham that he would have children and that the nation would be blessed through his seed. Genesis 12, the first three verses. And that he would have many descendants. There in Genesis 15, the statement is made in verses 2 through 5 that there would be as the stars of the heavens in number. But we know they took matters in their own hands. When Sarah had been barren all of her life, she was past the age of childbearing, and Abraham was old. So they took matters in their own hands. We read that in the 16th chapter. We see they blame God in verse 2. And they come up with another plan of bringing about a descendant of Abraham. In their commentary on the Old Testament, here's what Neil and Dietrich had to say. The resolution seemed a judicious one. And according to the customs of the East, there would be nothing wrong in carrying it, it out. Hence, Abraham consented without opposition. But they were both of them soon to learn that their thoughts were the thoughts of man and not of God, and that their wishes and actions were not in accordance with the divine promise. Murphy said in his notes on the Old Testament, Abraham yields to the suggestion of his wife and complies with the custom of the country. And the New English Translation Bible, first edition, had this note. Sarah simply sees this as a social custom of having a child through a surrogate. Not only was Abraham and Sarah influenced by cultures, also Lot was influenced. You remember in Genesis 13, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Abraham gave him a choice of which direction to go. The valley and the fields were green. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He dwelt in Sodom. He sat at the gate of Sodom. And we know that Sodom was a terribly wicked place. And the world around Lot greatly impacted his family. 
He was oppressed. He was tormented. Even Peter made that statement in 2 Peter 2 that Lot was vexed with the vain conversation day after day. And his own standard of morals got confused. Remember when the men came, the two angels came to Lot's house and the men of, men of Sodom showed up at the door? Bring them out that we may know them. Remember what Lot did? He offered them his two daughters. And we know in the end of it all in Genesis 19 and verse 30, he lost every time. We know he had two daughters that were virgins. We know he had one or more daughter because mention is made of son-in-laws. So I don't know how many daughters that, or that then there's nothing mentioned in, of, of boys, but there was more than three daughters. But then remember he lost his wife. She was told not to turn back and look and she did. She turned into a pillar of salt. So however many other children he had, he only was able to flee Sodom with two. And what we read in Genesis 19 and verse 30, he's living in a cave. He lost everything. So he was influenced by culture. Now I want to talk about and see how that we can work through these challenges. We, again, getting back to the point that we can't never get away from. We must have an absolute standard, an absolute guide, because we're not left to figure it out for ourselves. We know from Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, it's not in man that walks to direct his own steps. We know from Proverbs 16 and verse 25 that, it, that it is a way unto a man that seems right, but the end are of the ways of death. We know in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, we're not to lean on our own understanding. And we're warned not to follow the crowd. We're, we're warned not to follow culture, society. Exodus 23 and verse 12, we're not to follow a crowd to do evil. And we know in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14, that Jesus talks about two gates and two ways. There is that wide gate and there is that broad way, but then there is that narrow, narrow gate, and there is that difficult way. I forget the word. And you remember what Jesus said. He, he told us which one of those ways has the most traffic. It's that that takes you through the wide gate and puts you on the broad way. That's the way that leads to destruction. We need to let the word of God be our guide. I want us to turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's a very familiar passage to us, or at least verse 16 is. But I want us to go back and look and start with verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. See, these first five verses is talking about problems, major problems that's going on with people. So now let's look at what the reason is in verse 8. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do those who resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So there's a reason. They resist the truth. That's the reason why they're engaged in all of these things in verse 
first five verses. But then look at the answer, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So you see what we have here? The context of 2 Timothy 3, we have the problems that are going on, we see what the reason for the problem is, and we see what the answer for the problem is. God's Word. So, let God's Word be their God. And we know that God instituted marriage. He instituted the family. We know that the beginning of the family unit started in Genesis 2. We saw in that, or we'll see in that verse that it was not good for man to be alone. Verse 18. That God made a woman as a helper, suited, compatible, a meat for man. In verse 18. That God intended for man to become one with the woman. In verse 24. And so the creator of man created marriage in the family. Jesus refers to it in Matthew 19, that in the beginning, God made them male and female. And in Ephesians 5, verse 31, Paul said, I speak of a great mystery, but he said, let the wife, let the husband love the wife and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So God sets the rules to govern the family. Marriage involves a man, a male, and a woman, a female. And we see that in Genesis 2, verse 18 through 25, and, Genesis, and Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. So let's look at it. Genesis 2. The Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper compatible to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them and where whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought it to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and we're not ashamed. Now let's look at Matthew. What Jesus said in Matthew 19. He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. You see, marriage involves a man and a woman. It is not a man and a man. Marriage is not a woman and a woman. Marriage is not a person and an animal. That is not marriage. And marriage is to be monogamous. That is one man and one woman. Not one man and two women, or three, or not one woman and three or four men. It's to be monogamous, one. One man for one woman, and it's to be permanent. That's what we just read in Matthew 19. There is to be one man for one woman. They are to cleave to each other. They are one flesh, and God has joined them together. And two, God has given us the keys to a successful marriage. We need to be determined to follow the Lord. Just like Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. 
We have to make that choice. We must be determined to follow the Lord. We need to be committed to each other. We saw that in Genesis 2 and verse 24 when they were, the man and the woman were to cleave. That word cleave means to glue, to cement together. They are now one flesh. That is, their lives have been blended. They are to be in full acceptance of each other. They're to take time and to make time for each other. And they're to work hard to communicate. They're to love each other. In Ephesians 5, verse 22, all the way through verse 31, husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands are to love their wives as they love their own body. And then that verse 31 says, so that the wives reverence her husband. Somebody says, well, it doesn't say in Ephesians 5 for, for a wife to love her husband. No, it don't say that specifically, but you just need to turn over to the book of Titus. Turn over there to Titus 2 and verse 4, and older women are to teach the younger women what? To love their husbands. So they're to love each other. They're to respect each other. And Peter talks about it in the first seven verses of chapter 3. They're to treat their mate the way they want to be treated. And that takes us back to the golden rule. In Matthew 7 and verse 12. And we're to deny self. And I think we've talked about that enough in the auditorium class on, on Wednesday night. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34, Jesus said to his disciples, If a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And we need to be willing to accept our roles. And society has a whole, whole lot about saying what your roles are, but we don't need to listen. We need to be willing to accept our roles. So yes, the home is in deep trouble. But I hope that by looking at what those challenges are, by looking at what is the cause of those challenges, and seeing that yes, there is a way that we can work through the challenges. We've got everything that we need right here. Right here. We don't need magazines, books, psychology, sociology, all of the social media. All that we need is just right here. And we'll be what God wants us to be. We'll be the Christian God wants us to be. We'll be the husband God wants us to be. We'll be the wife that God wants us to be. We'll be the child that God wants us to be. We'll be the parent that God wants us to be. We'll have the family that God wants us to be. But it's going to take strict adherence to the standard and realize that we do have one. Tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I know this lesson has not been to put you thinking in that direction, but it's hope, I hope to help to put us in the direction of some things that, that they need to be directed toward. Let's not despair. Yes, we live in a godless society. And yes, it's everywhere around us. It's everywhere we look. Let us not despair. We have God on our side. And if he is for us, who can be against us? But we're going to have to stick firmly to his word. But if you're here tonight and you've not obeyed the gospel, and tonight is in time that you thought and are doing some thinking about it, don't put it off. Let now be the time. Come forward. In repentance of your sins, in confessing your faith that Christ is the Son of God, and be buried with him in baptism. If you're here and you're a Christian and yet there's sin in your life, repent and pray. If necessary, we'll pray with you and for you. Please take this time and opportunity. While together we stand to sing.